Hey everyone, I'm Wardy from Traditional Cooking School and Wardy.com, and I'm joined today by Dr. Smith. Hi, Dr. Smith. Hello. Thanks, Thanks for, for joining me. me again. So glad you could make it. I want to give a quick update of what we're doing today. Dr. Smith has joined me before, but in case this is your first time hearing from him, he is a naturopathic doctor in Arizona. He has a refreshing approach to healing and nutrition and healing. He's actually a detective and he goes by the name Nutrition Detective Online. And that really suits what he's doing because he does have foundational approaches, but he's really trying to see what is going on in an individual person's body to help them heal from various issues. His foundational approach is addressing toxins, removing toxins, and addressing nutritional deficiencies. And he's really had marvelous success helping people heal from the simplest to the most debilitating of issues. I have interviewed Dr. Smith before on the topic of balancing hormones naturally. That link will be included with this video if you want to go there. But let's talk a little bit about what today's topic is. It is the skin. And the skin is the first thing people see. You might say it's the window to what's going on inside our bodies. Our skin really expresses our health, our state of health. So while we might be concerned about that, which I think we are, I think we also just hate it when our skin looks bad for call it vanity or whatever. We just really dislike it. And we might have chronic issues throughout our lives, eczema, psoriasis, acne. And then some of us later on in life might look in the mirror one day and say, oh my goodness, what is going on? Because just all of a sudden, I look so old. Where did these wrinkles come from? Why do I have brown spots? Is this cancer? And it can be very concerning. So we're going to talk about a lot of those things today, why it might be happening, some insights into that, and hopefully get some encouragement from Dr. Smith as to what to do about it. So I'm excited to learn today because I really... I might have a little bit of an idea of where we're going, but I really don't know what Dr. Smith is going to say. So it's going to be good. <laughs> okay. So Dr. Smith, would you add anything about your background before we dive into the topic? I've been in practice since about 2006 and I've gone through, as a lot of people out there have done for their own health, I went through various phases of learning and thinking that almost every alternative doctor or whatever gets into the idea of like, this causes everything. Like they go through a candida phase or they go through a heavy metal phase or they go through a carbs cause all disease phase. And so then all carbs are bad or they go through all these different phases. And I've been through most of the major ones enough to put them all together. And with what I've been doing now, linking them all together to the liver's health and the bile, I have, in terms of skin stuff, I had psoriasis on my knuckles. I had several bouts with skin fungus, including tinea versicolor and dandruff and athlete's foot. So I did have a tendency towards skin issues myself, and I was able to, I've been able to get rid of all of them now. Yeah, people actually, as I was doing more of what I'm doing now, a lot of people I know deal with dry skin, and I actually got to the point where commonly I feel like my skin is like internally moisturized. It's really strange and I'm, I'm not bragging. It's something that surprises me over and over again, where I'm like rubbing my forehead and I'm like, I think skin people would really love to feel my skin and just go, <laughs> they would be like, you don't use anything on it. And I'd be like, no, I don't, I don't do that. And so one of the things before we start, I, I'll just go on this real topically, but we'll probably get into it a lot more later. So people will say in naturopathic medicine or other holistic health that your skin reflects the health of your gut. Uh -huh. Because when you think about it, the in, you know, that your intestines open up into your, you could look at it going top to bottom or either, right? So your mouth goes down into your stomach. Well, this flips over at your skin. So it's a continuous, you're like an uh, would you ever see one of those squiggly, the jello things where they have the middle and you can just like pull them yes. and they keep rotating around, right? So that's like what we are. We're like a tube inside of like, we got our outside and we got the inside tube and we're just like a continuous tube. So it makes sense that the skin on our inside can reflect the skin on the outside. Mm -hmm. But then if we start going, well, why do skin things flare up and what, how did our gut change? What made our gut change? What made our skin change? If this is true and in naturopathic medicine and other al alternative medicines, they'll say all your health or when in doubt, treat the gut. That's what they'll say. When in doubt, treat the gut. Okay. Well, what are they treating? What is wrong down there? 
what are the root causes of what they're saying is wrong down there? And so if they say to treat the gut, to treat the skin, what are they treating? And as we'll get into this stuff, it's the toxic bile that is really affecting the gut. And if that penetrates into your bloodstream, then it tends to come out of your skin. So we'll get into those theories a little deeper as we go. But yeah, it's all, I, I've fixed my own skin issues. We have skin issues get helped all the time. I don't know if you've had any personally, but we, yeah, there's nutrients that are involved. There's toxicities that are involved and we just work on all of them at the same time. So yeah. That was a great teaser. I'm so glad you brought that up about the inner skin and the outer skin. I can just picture that a balloon thing filled with gel just keeps going. <laughs> That's such a great analogy. So you've teased that really well. So let's dive in now to, I don't know if you want to break these up at all, but I was thinking about skin conditions like psoriasis, mm -hmm. eczema, rosacea, acne, cancer even. And then I was thinking about sort of vanity things we'd be concerned about, sunspots, age spots, skin tags, wrinkles. Do you, would you break those up or would you put that all together when you're talking about why? Well, I could talk about them all in a general sense. And then for certain ones of them, we can break them down into individual things. Let's do that. Okay. So let's do the general sense first. My whole <laughs> paradigm shifting approach to medicine was inspired by Grant Genereux and Anthony Mawson. And one of the things that Anthony Mawson in his 34 papers where he's been connecting like all sorts of diseases to basically cholestasis or toxic bile from your liver leaking into your blood. So normally what's normally supposed to happen, we are not supposed to have bile in our blood. So what is bile? Your liver, right? It's your detox organ. Hopefully you know enough about health that you know that your liver is your primary detox organ. If you think of it as it's both a storage site, because your liver, if you don't think the liver stores things because of what other people in the health world have told you, go on the internet and go on PubMed, pubmed.gov and use the word accumulate. Don't use the word store, use accumulate. Because if you have a storage room for your stuff, why do you have a storage room? Because you've accumulated too much stuff. So the liver does store things. In the research, you look up the word accumulate or content, and you'll see that the liver and the kidneys hold all sorts of stuff. So the liver is a storage site. It's also a, I call it a sewage processing plant, Right. So sewage processing plants, we send our waste there so it can process it and make it into hopefully something that's smaller and denser and easier to throw away rather than just throwing all that water back out in the, the nasty, dirty water back out in the environment. But it also it's you're breaking it down into stuff that is, is easier to dispose of. It may be more toxic. It may be more concentrated toxicity, but you can get rid of it easier. So there's that. And it is a filter. People will say the liver is not a filter, but when you think of a filter, like if you think of a water filter at your house, you run things through it and a filter by definition is something that takes stuff out of something else, right? So if you have a water filter, it's taking toxins out of your water. That's a filter. That's by definition. So your liver is a filter. It takes things out of your blood. It runs them through the sewage processing plant. Some of those things get stored. And then what happens with the rest of it? It's put into the bile. The bile is your, the easiest way I think to have to think of it is your, the bile is your liver's poop. It, your liver has to poop out. You're like, it's a sewage processing plant. It's still, it doesn't magically make everything disappear. It has to get rid of the toxic concentrate. This is your bile. So a lot of people out on the internet, a lot of people in the alternative world love to talk about bile as it's a wonderful, wonderful thing. And you need it to digest your fats and absorb nutrients and all this stuff. And I'm kind of going, mm, that's also where we get rid of a lot of our toxicity. So what can happen if you look up the words liver injury or cholestasis, which these are the technical terms in the research, basically what you get down to when you have those things is you are leaking that toxic bile, however you got to this place, whether it's medications or I call them pokies, those things they give us to boost our immune system. It could be those, it could be exposures to toxins, whether it's toxic metals, whether it's plasticizers, whether it's pesticides, whether it's whatever, and certain supplements can cause liver damage and all sorts of stuff. So anyway, you start leaking this bile into your bloodstream. This now it's in your bloodstream. This is the most toxic fluid by definition your body makes. By definition, bile is the most toxic thing in your body. This leaks into your blood. It can go everywhere, anywhere your brain, your heart, your muscles, your bones, your reproductive organs, 
your skin. So the bile goes into the blood. What can then now deal with this toxic bile floating around your blood, which contains all these things? It goes to your kidneys first because your kidneys are working on, they're all, they also filter the blood. They try to get rid of it. What if your liver can't get rid of it fast enough and your kidneys can't get fat, rid of it fast enough? People love to talk about how the skin is your largest detox organ. This may be true. Okay. Do you want things coming out of your skin? Well, here's the difference between your liver to your bile to your poop, which is how you are supposed to get rid of it primarily, or the blood to your kidneys to pee, and so you get rid of it that way. <laughs> when you poop, you get to leave that toxicity behind and you walk away from it, right? It's gone. It's not touching your body anymore. That's what I'm getting at. It's not touching your body anymore. Your pee, right? You leave that behind too. You got to walk away from that. It's out of you. It's gone. Let's say you were pushing out a toxin or multiple toxins in your sweat or in your sebum, in your skin oils. When it comes out of your skin, where does it go? It goes nowhere. It just sits there. So let's say these toxic things are coming out through your skin and they're irritating your skin on the way out. And then they just sit there on the tissues, potentially getting reabsorbed and damaging the skin until they're gone. You ever, you, people who have had acne, they've heard about you need to wash your face like multiple times a day. Right? Mm -hmm. How would that help unless you are washing away something toxic from the top of your skin that is then helping you not to have a reaction there? So... One of the ideas that I work on in terms of skin problems, and then so toxic bile, if they say that the health of your gut reflects is reflected in the health of your skin, if you have toxic bile coating your guts, and then you have that toxic bile actually eating through your guts and your bile ducts and your liver and getting into your bloodstream, and then it comes out through your skin, then we have a connection between the two. And so this is how when your diet gets bad, your skin could get bad because your bile gets more toxic and you have more toxins coming up through your skin. So we have a connection now between these things. And that is what I work on. That is the drive behind my approaches. And we see skin conditions improve and go away all the time. People might ask, what do you do for acne, Dr. Smith? What do you do for rosacea? What do you do for this? What do you do for this? This guy has a protocol and he says to use this herb and this guy has this and he says, don't do this. And then what do you do? I don't have protocols for any particular condition. We work on the things you mentioned earlier. We work on not putting toxins in. We work on helping the body to get rid of stored toxins and we give the body the nutrients, especially minerals that it needs to both protect itself from these poisons that are in it and to help the body to get rid of it. So there is no protocol. Now, what do I do that individualizes things is I I look at hair and blood tests to give people what I think are good starting doses. And then over time, as we do like the, my office hours, my follow-up that's included in these packages, and then also retesting, then we adjust people up and down to get them what they need. So the overall approach is generally the same, but the fine tuning is in the dosing. If I had somebody who told me they absolutely couldn't take something because it always caused them a problem, then they don't take it. We don't force it. Right. If somebody shouldn't be getting worse, if we're giving them what they need. So that's the basic okay. idea of it. I would like you to clarify on the mm -hmm. pathway of the bile okay. it gets to the blood and gets to the skin. That's not where it's supposed to be. So could you just address how that happens? Yes. Okay. Okay. So let me back up to the normal bile. I call it the bile pathway. So the normal bile pathway, the liver cells make the bile. They produce the bile and they're also taking stored toxins and like vitamin A, which I think is a toxin and it's, we can get into that later, but vitamin A, copper, manganese, lead, cadmium, mercury, arsenic takes all these plasticizers, BPA, pesticides, puts them into the bile. That bile then inside the liver. So if you're familiar with the blood vessels, there's like capillaries. They're the tiniest blood vessels out at the ends of your fingers, your toes, your skin. Okay. So you have like capillary sized 
bile ducts inside your liver. So there's little teeny, the teeniest, tiniest bile ducts that go from the cell, makes the bile. It goes into the teeniest, tiniest bile ducts. And these are still inside the liver. Those all come together into bigger and bigger bile ducts, like bigger and bigger blood vessels, like up to your aorta, the biggest one. And then those are called, there's the common bile duct, which part of that breaks off and goes to your gallbladder. So then we have the bile ducts that are outside of the liver. So the liver makes the bile, goes into the little teeniest, tiniest bile ducts. Then it goes into the biggest bile ducts, the common bile duct, and then other places. Okay. Then that feeds into your small intestine. And then normally with a normal standard American diet, right? Which is not good, but a standard American diet in the research, as the bile goes along your intestines, 95% of it is reabsorbed into a very special blood system for your intestines that goes, it's like your security system, that blood from your intestines, like if it was going to absorb food, it's also absorbing toxic bile and other toxins. It goes right into what's called the portal venous system or the portal vein, which is a big vein that goes right to your liver. Think of it as the security checkpoint at the airport. Like they're going to make everybody go through this one point. They're going to make all the stuff you absorb in your guts go through the liver first before it can go into the system. Okay. So that is what's called. So that 95% of it is reabsorbed. 5% of that bile, that toxic bile actually gets pooped out in a day. So 95% of it goes right back to your liver and only 5% of it is pooped out. So now just imagine if let's say if that's your best way of getting rid of toxic bile of toxicity, what if you don't eat things that grab onto the bile? What if you ate more things that grabbed onto the bile and helped you poop more of them out? What if you don't eat things that grab onto the bile? And so even when you poop them out, you're pooping out even less than 5% and most of it's going back to your liver. Or what if you're just taking in more toxins than you get rid of? Then you're just the math of it, you're slowly accumulating toxicity. It's just it, like I love the Dave Ramsey, it's just math. Like really, if you put in more toxins than you can get rid of, it's just math. You're getting more toxic day to day. So that's the normal bile pathway. In the research, though, if you look up liver injury or cholestasis or cholestatic, those are key words. What these words mean is that there's an injury to the liver and things are leaking. They're going places they're not supposed to be. The liver, so there's one thing called intrahepatic cholestasis, which is cholestasis or bile leakage inside of the liver. So in the liver cells or in the teeniest, tiniest bile ducts, those can start leaking. There's interesting things that you can look up in the literature called vanishing bile duct syndrome. Ooh. Many medications can cause vanishing bile duct syndrome, which means the bile ducts just poof, disappear. What do you think would happen if, let's say, the pipe that went to your toilet suddenly disappeared and was when it was now, instead of being a pipe, it's now a wall? What do you think would happen when you try to flush your toilet, right? Back pressure. <laughs> you have poopy water all over your floor. Water that's dirty water that you don't want there. That's doing bad things. It's going to start growing mold. It's going to start causing disease. It's going to start doing all these things. So when you think of bile flowing the wrong direction. If you think of a toilet backing up and putting bad things into places you don't want it, that's that. So that's intrahepatic cholestasis. It means intra is inside, hepatic is liver, cholestasis is bi- basically the way to think of cholestasis, it's bile going where it's not supposed to go. So that's one, that's the big one. Then we have extrahepatic cholestasis, which is where in the common bile ducts, in the big bile ducts, or leaky gut. Many people out there have heard about leaky gut and they'll say all disease is caused by leaky gut. And you go, so that they say things are leaking from the gut into the bloodstream, things that aren't supposed to be in the bloodstream. Does this sound familiar now? That's extra hepatic cholestasis. Also extra hepatic cholestasis. If you have any kind of GERD or nausea or heartburn reflux, that's actually the reason why modern medicine has gotten nowhere with acid reflux is because it's actually a bile problem. It's bile coming backwards up into your stomach. And that's why they don't get anywhere with, that's why they never fix it. They're treating stomach acid when it's actually bile acids coming into your stomach, which is even more confusing because bile as a whole is alkaline. So you got a whole, it's a whole nother problem. They call it bile acids, but actually the whole of bile is alkaline. That's extra hepatic cholestasis. That's bile leakage 
or bile going the wrong way outside of the liver. So as an example, let me go over how could leaky gut happen from toxic bile? Because that's a big topic out there today, right? And if we're talking about the gut reflecting the skin, da, 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 retinoic acid, vitamin A. So retinoic, we're going to talk about retinoic acid later. I saw that in the questions. So retinoic acid is something that when you consume any vitamin A, whether it's carotenoids from plants like beta carotene and carrots, or your sweet potatoes, or whatever, or you're eating egg yolks, yellow, or liver, or dairy's high in vitamin A, whether it's because of the cows eating grass, or whether it's because of them feeding the cows vitamin A, or alfalfa, or whatever they're feeding. So all vitamin A eventually, as it goes through the detox systems of your body, ends up as retinoic acids. One of the things that they do for especially ladies, like ladies are going to be the ones who get more chemical peels, right? We're talking about skin today, but anybody can get a chemical peel on their face, right? But they have one called a yellow peel. You'll notice the color yellow come up a lot in the stuff I talk about. They have a yellow peel. It is what's called all trans retinoic acid. What it does in the literature, they've said we use all trans retinoic acid or retinoic acids to induce a controlled wound on the face a controlled wound of your face skin. They're saying, we know if we give just this amount, it will only melt so many layers of skin. So then imagine if you're one of the ways your body gets rid of vitamin A, which I'm telling you is a toxin, is to put that vitamin A into your bile. Your body detoxes vitamin A into retinoic acids. You now just released a bunch of liquid that contains yellow peel that is used to induce controlled wounds on the skin. It now coats all of your intestines. Do you think if it can melt your face skin, that it can cause your guts to get leaky, especially when they're not controlling the amount? So that's just one method of how vitamin A in the diet can cause, vitamin A causes cholestasis in the liver. We got the research to show this. And then vitamin A, when it turns into retinoic acid, it can actually melt your top layers of skin cells, which would then allow bile to leak past into your bloodstream and then cause all the problems of toxic bile flowing everywhere. So that's that's kind of a little deeper into the toxic bile theory of disease. I haven't come up with a good name for it yet. That's as good as I got right now. That's the basics of that. Okay, that's, How do we do? That's good. I think that's very important just to understand the normal bile flow and the bile flow that causes us problems and how it can happen. So I'm really glad you went into that. And now Perfect. let's tackle the individual skin conditions or skin issues. I'll let you pick based on what you think you want to address first. So what I do with my clients when I work with people is I go over their biggest concerns, which if somebody comes into me and they say their labs are off in a certain way, and they're saying, I have insomnia. I, I want to do things that will help. I don't care about their labs. If their labs can help me help their insomnia, that's great. But I care more about helping their insomnia first, right? Because that's what's bothering them. So when people have skin issues and they tell me about it, what I do in my consultations is I tell them, here's the things you need to concentrate on the most. Mm -hmm. So what I can do is I'll go over general things for skin that I focus on. And then we can go over if there are specific things for any particular condition, then I'll mention those. So I'm looking here, psoriasis. So like I had psoriasis, right? I mentioned that. It's so nice not to have it. I still kind of look at my knuckles and I go, oh, it's still gone. Good. Mine wasn't that bad. I know other people suffer with it <laughs> hundreds of times more than I do or did. Any skin condition, I will tell people any skin condition, generally there's going to be some amount of vitamin A toxicity in the system. And so we work on that. In terms of nutrients, the big one that I focus on is zinc. And I almost always find zinc deficiencies in people when they have skin conditions. So always, what I always tell people is, if you've got skin conditions, we need to look at zinc. And these are things that if somebody said, how do you know that that's the thing that does it? We use, as you know, Wardy, we use so many different little approaches combining to make a big approach that... If something goes away for you, you don't know what did it generally because we've got so many things going on. But we also try to turn it into variables that one variable at a time people are trying to change as much as you can in real life. 
we're trying to change one variable at a time. So sometimes people can say, I did this and it got better. So sometimes they can say that. So anyway, so eczema. So let me just bring up eczema. Grant Genereux, the guy I learned about vitamin A toxicity from, he has three free books at his blog, ggenereux.blog. I'm sure we'll spell it out for you or, or Wardy will have it all typed out because his last name is kind of hard to spell if you don't know how to spell it. Anyway, so he had three things when he figured out that vitamin A was a problem and he started avoiding it. He had really, really bad eczema. He had jaundice. He was completely yellow and he had chronic kidney disease where they were about to the point of putting him on dialysis. And through his particular diet, this is what he did. This is not what I recommend for everybody, but this is what he did. He did a beef or bison and black beans and either brown or white rice. So that was the extent of the variety in his diet. It's a very low vitamin A diet. It's actually a relatively low copper diet. And he got rid of all three of those conditions over time. So in terms of what made the eczema go away, well, he was definitely on a low vitamin A diet. And that was probably the big cause. Rosacea, when I first started doing the low vitamin A diet, very quickly, I got a testimonial of rosacea going away. And just so any of you guys know, vitamin A science is so terrible that they look at the blood. They look at blood vitamin A, which has next to nothing to do with how much vitamin A you have stored in your liver. So people will say, well, why not? And I'd say, does the amount of money you carry in your wallet at any one time directly correlate to how much money you have in your savings account? And people will say, well, no, those two have nothing to do with each other. And I go, see, <laughs> right? See, the storage has nothing to do with what is free floating through your body. But when you look at studies, let's just hit on rosacea and while we're at it, we'll hit on what's called the KP, keratosis pilaris, mm -hmm. which also a lot of people know as the chicken skin, you know, like the red bumpy things you get on the back of your arms. Typically, I used to have those too. And when people go and they look at the research, they'll say KP, keratosis pilaris, there's multiple studies that show that it's associated with low vitamin A in the blood. And I go, okay, well, we have person upon person upon person upon person who has gotten rid of their KP by avoiding vitamin A. So is it really a deficiency condition or is it maybe a toxicity condition in their liver and you just don't see it in the blood? Now, some people out there, there's a very weird thing with these toxins. Sometimes people will take some vitamin A or some cod liver oil and they'll see cod liver oil is high in vitamin A and they'll see their condition improve for a couple of weeks, maybe a month or two. And they think, oh, I'm fixing my deficiency and it's all going to be gone for good. And then the problem comes back and it's worse. Yes. And then they have to take more of the vitamin A or cod liver oil to make it go away again. And it doesn't go away quite as much and it doesn't stay gone for as long. And then they triple down. So they, they already doubled down and they triple down and they take more. And then all of a sudden it doesn't work anymore. And now they're wondering, well, I should have fixed my vitamin A deficiency by now. Why is it back and why is it worse? You can use toxins to suppress symptoms. This is the whole basis of conventional modern medicine is using toxins to stop a process in the body that slowly festers and worsens underneath it until all of a sudden you get to the point where you're on one medication, two medications, three medications, four medications, you're taking medications for side effects. You can do the same thing with poisons, natural poisons. So this is the effect that people get with their KP when they take high vitamin A things. They're suppressing a process in their body, which works for a little while until it stops working. And then they're left even more toxic. And the thing they used to use that seemed like it worked doesn't work anymore. Now we go, so you mentioned here acne. Acne is absolutely, there's absolutely copper toxicity involved in acne. There's both vitamin A toxicity and copper toxicity. This is why the old, if you want to call it a wives tale or an urban legend of chocolate being associated with acne, chocolate is extremely high in copper. I can tell you if you're out there watching this and you have a chocolate addiction or you feel like you're just totally hooked on chocolate, you're absolutely copper toxic. Well, people say, why would I be addicted if I, how do I have copper toxicity if I'm addicted? Remember, people don't get addicted to healthy things. People get addicted to unhealthy things. So if you have an unhealthy attachment 
to chocolate, you're addicted to something in it. That can be copper. I've got papers showing that people can become addicted to vitamin A and carrots and stuff like that. So it's actually as strong. Some people have said it's as strong an addiction as tobacco, like smoking is. And this is in the literature. This is in the scientific literature. There's always a zinc deficiency with acne. That doesn't mean you go and you take high dose zinc to get rid of your acne. It might help, but can you get zinc toxicity? Sure. You can overdo anything. I take zinc very seriously. That's why I tested in both hair and blood. I don't mess around with zinc and copper. I test both of them in hair and blood. So anyway, but acne's always got vitamin A toxicity. There's usually copper toxicity. If you were to look at the list of things that people will say flares up acne, I could look at that list and I'd say it's either high vitamin A or it's high copper. Mm. Guaranteed. Grant Jenneru, how did he figure out to avoid vitamin A? I think he's a geological engineer. If I'm correct, he's an engineer. I just forget which type he is. He found lists on various websites of the 10 things that aggravated eczema. So he looked at that list of foods and he looked at what was the common thing in all of these 10 foods. What did they all have? The only thing he found was vitamin A out in nine out of 10 of them. So he said, okay, here goes nothing. Let's make a low, a super low vitamin A diet. There is no such thing as a zero vitamin A diet. He did what's the lowest vitamin A diet that he could come up with that he thought was sustainable. And he came up with what I told you earlier. And over a year or two, all of his horrible eczema, his eczema, he said he had it under his armpits and it was just yellow and crusty and it caused him a lot of pain. Like he was in pain from it and it, it all went away. So that was how he figured that out. And now that I know what's in foods better, when I look at the acne trigger foods, there's always copper and vitamin A. Then we have cancer. Okay. I don't want to get too deep into cancer today. I kind of, I'll give this the superficial treatment because cancer is obviously a very legally landmine field to go into. Because if people were to know that cancer is really the body's attempt. So why is cancer your own cells? Why is your body making extra tissue to what is this extra tissue doing? Do we believe that our body has gone haywire and is now working against itself, that we have these cells that have gone rogue? Do we believe that? Or in my world, do we believe that this reaction by the body must be some sort of last ditch attempt? by the body to deal with something. So this is a very different concept. Are we victims of our own body or is our body doing the absolute best it can in the situation that we have given it? Are we at war with our own cells, the war on cancer or just like children, if the children are having problems, should do we, are they our flesh and blood and we should figure out what's wrong and adjust around it and help bring them back. Or do we want to just try to kick them out of the house, right? I'll tell you which one I would want to do. So <laughs> fatty liver, let's back up again. Fatty liver. If I were to tell you that I think a lot of the toxins that we encounter, pesticides and plasticizers and all this stuff are fat soluble. And if I were to tell you that vitamin A is fat soluble, and if bile backs up in the liver, what does bile help you absorb in your diet? Oh, a fat and fat soluble vitamins? So if the body was going to store fatty things in the liver and it was running out of space to do so, what might the body in its wisdom make more of in the liver? It would might make more fat. So fatty liver can be an attempt by the body to create more tissue to store more toxicity. So if that theory is understandable by you. Then if we start going, okay, what if the body has an exposure over time, over years to a certain toxin or a certain combination of toxins where the body is running out of space to store it? What then could the body make to create more storage space for it? Your body could make like cells that don't do much other than just sit there and soak up poison. Cancer may be a very well a 
reaction by your body, a last ditch attempt to create areas to store this toxicity. People go, why would your body store these toxins? Why doesn't it just get rid of it? I then ask people, why do you have that extra room of stuff in your house that you never get rid of because you never have the time to get rid of it? Like, why do we all have junk rooms? Why do we have so much crap in our garages? Why do we have storage rooms? Why do we have a junk drawer that we never go through? We just can't get rid of it fast enough. We don't take the time to get rid of it. We don't have the ability to get rid of it. Or somebody else says, why don't you keep that around? We might use it later or whatever. Anyway, your body either has to make a choice with toxins, either it lets it run free into the blood. Let's say that security, that portal vein that goes right into the liver that brings all the stuff from your intestines, it's either going to stop it and do the bouncer thing where it's going to let things through or not. If it lets things through, they just go right into your bloodstream and then they're going to get to your brain and your heart and all these things. Or the liver says, I can't afford to let it go into the bloodstream. So I'm going to put it here in the liver or your body may be saying, well, we're running out of space. Other places, we better start creating this thing here, this new tissue here. And that's basically what I believe cancer is. Now, Grant wrote, a fr- Grant has three free eBooks on his website. He has a whole eBook there about the connections that he's found between vitamin A toxicity and breast cancer. So he has a whole book on breast cancer. When you think about it, vitamin A, is it fat soluble? Yeah. What are breasts made of? Oh, fat. Weird that we might store too much of this toxin there. And then we end up getting problems. Another funny thing about skin conditions, a lot of them, for those of you who have them, is oftentimes as the skin conditions get worse, what color often do skin conditions tend to take on? Yes. They tend to have a yellowish tint to them, right? Eczema is often yellow. Often if you let whiteheads, acne, sit there long enough, if you don't pick it all off, you can often see a yellowish tint to the white head. Some people sweat, like, why do people get yellow armpit stains? What do you think's in there, right? So we have, there's all sorts of things that poisons in general are often yellow. Just so you know, yellow is often a color in nature of poisons and bitter things. Let me continue on to the next one. Why do we have age spots, sunspots, skin tags? Okay, so I'm going to break those into age spots and skin sunspots, or like what they, what some people call liver spots. So age spots and sunspots, as we, or yeah, as we talked about, can be associated with toxic bile and the liver. Okay. What then would be the compound that's associated with that? That would probably be toxic bile and whatever's in it. Now, people will then talk about lipofusion or lipofuscin, however you want to say it, L-I-P-O-F-U-S-C-I-N. It's a, it's considered a pigment that is part of those liver spots or sunspots. It would might maybe interest people to know that if you go into the research, you'll find that carotenoids, plant vitamin A, is part of the lipofuscin molecule. It's also part of the LDL molecule, the bad cholesterol. Mm. So if we have age spots and sunspots actually containing vitamin A, like plant vitamin A, we already know that when people eat too much they drink too much carrot juice or they eat too many sweet potatoes or they eat too much liver or whatever. They can turn orange or yellow. So we know that we store vitamin A. What's right under your skin? What do we have a layer of right under our skin? Fat, right? So if we're going to store fat soluble poisons and we don't have enough room in our liver or we need more room immediately, we can put it in the skin and it shows up in the skin. So on that note, So that's the bile connection, the toxicity to those. But I remember when I used to work in a supplement store way back before naturopathic medical school, I remember somebody coming in and saying what skin cancer was in their impression. What skin cancer is, is it's toxicity in your skin that has then due to the sun gotten baked in place. Right, It's like a baking in of toxins in your skin. And back then I was like, 
whatever, dude. Like he was just some guy coming in and being like, oh yeah, skin talking to the somebody else who worked there. Skin cancer is this. And I went back then I went, yeah, okay, whatever, dude. Like I, I was like a 19 years old or something. No, I was probably like 22 or 23 thinking I knew everything. Right. And then all of a sudden later I started, and when I'm thinking of this stuff, I go, wait, maybe it is. So couldn't sunspots be toxicity baked into the skin? Yeah. Could your skin get in a way charred? Could it burn? So what happens when you burn something on your stove in a pan, right? It makes a crusty, dark thing. What happens when you're out in the sun too long? You can turn red or you can turn kind of burnt looking, right? When you think of cooking, cooking, right? You cook a chicken, it browns. Is tanning actually a good thing? Because then why does your body get rid of it? Why, when you stop going out in the sun, do you lose your tan? Are you healing? Are you getting rid of that burnt skin? Because we can turn over cells. Why wouldn't you keep it? If it was so wonderful, why wouldn't we keep it? So anyway, that's just a whole nother thing. But so skin cancer may simply be toxins burned into the skin. And now what doctors are seeing with liposuction, because people are trying to eat healthy. I've actually seen quotes from plastic surgeons who do liposuction. And I do that because that's the motion they do with that fat sucker thing, right? They'll say they can tell when people eat healthy because the fat that comes out is orange. Yeah. When you think of fat in your mind, is it orange? Like when you think of a steak with fat on it, is it orange? It's not supposed to be orange. It's supposed to be white. Orange fat on a piece of beef would look sick to me. Like my intuitive thing would be like, that's not what it's supposed to look like. And now I've got this whole thing about eating orange things. Like I absolutely avoid eating anything orange. <laughs> oh, skin tags, skin tags. Let's go over skin tags. Let's uh, just real quick. Skin tags are, I, I can't say what causes them, but they are generally associated with poor blood sugar control. Mm. They're very common on diabetics and they tend to happen where things rub off and they'll happen around collars or they'll happen in the groin. I used to have some skin tags. I had some in some sensitive areas. I used to be very hypoglycemic. I've had plenty of health issues in my life. Thank goodness mine were never that bad. That I, I, then the reason I say that is because they never got in the way of me researching. They didn't stop me from doing, getting here. But anyway, so if you go into the research, Anthony Mawson, the, the cold stasis guy, he's gone into tons of research. He hasn't published the paper yet, but he's got tons of research showing that vitamin A worsens your blood sugar control and leads to lowering your insulin sensitivity, or you could say increasing your insulin resistance, which when that gets really bad, that's diabetes. Mm -hmm. And diabetics tend to have a lot of skin tags. Coincidence. Okay. So then I have a video on my YouTube channel where I show that vitamin A depletes magnesium. What if I were to tell you that when I first got into topical magnesium, using magnesium absorbed through the skin, I thought, what if I apply it to my skin tags, my little ones under my armpit, and I had one in my groin. After I did that long enough, they went away. I don't know if they fell off or whatever. I was just all of a sudden one day, I was like, where is it? Where are they? Where did they go? And then I checked the groin one. I'm like, wow, that's gone too. Holy cow. So but what is magnesium? If you go and look in the research, magnesium and diabetics, magnesium really helps blood sugar stability. Oh. Vitamin A depletes magnesium. Vitamin A causes poor blood sugar stability. And when you get all this stuff, and when I started doing magnesium, oh my gosh, it helped me so much. Was it that my blood sugar stability got better and then the skin tags fell off? Or was it the magnesium in that area got restored and then they fell off? Or I don't know. This is why I never know exactly what did it. I just hit these things from multiple angles. And then I was able to, as I learned more about this, I was able to look back at my history and what I did and say, this is why this worked because it's connected. And this is why... I got worse doing these things. So anyway, that's, I think that's all the ones you listed. <laughs> that's all I listed, but you mentioned dandruff earlier. So would you talk about that one really sure. quick? Dandruff is actually associated with a skin fungus, a specific type of skin fungus. So I had tinea versicolor, I had a skin fungus on my chest, like right under my chest line and also my elbows. And then I had athlete's foot and dandruff. Most people tend to think of dandruff as dry skin because that's the way it shows up to them, right? When I use the clippers on my head, I used to have like snow afterwards because it was th both the dry skin and then rubbing it with the spiky clippers would, oh man, it was bad. I'd take a shower afterwards and then I'd still put my shirt on afterwards and I'd get it all. I wouldn't normally have dandruff, but when I aggravated it, oh man, it was everywhere. 
So with the tinea versicolor, so let's go into sometimes so how we can help some of these things with minerals. So what is in the anti-dandruff shampoos? A lot of people don't always look at them. They just go, it's a dandruff shampoo. It's a medicated shampoo. Well, Selsun Blue. S-E-L at the start of that word. And then if you flip it over and you look at the active ingredients, you'll see selenium. I think it's selenium sulfide. So the active ingredient in dandruff shampoos is a mineral. Wow. Head and shoulders. The active ingredient, I forget which zinc it is. I think it's zinc pyrethrothionine, but it's zinc. So when I was a teenager dealing with this tinea versicolor, and I went to the dermatologist and they said, you're just going to get it every year. They're like, some people are susceptible to it. If you're susceptible to it, you're an athlete. You sweat a lot. It's in the air. Like it's a spore in the air, I think was what he said. And you'll just get it on your skin again and it'll grow again. So if we kill it with medications like ketoconazole, and for those of you, especially men or anybody who's worried about low testosterone, if you ever took ketoconazole, go type in ketoconazole and testosterone. On any search engine, you'll find that ketoconazole, an antifungal medication, destroys testosterone levels, destroys them. I did that. I took it orally and I I don't know that I felt that bad after it, but it killed it and it came back. And I was like, I'm not going to do that again. And even as a teenager, I was still hesitant on medications, which is probably good. I know it's good. Anyway, so then I thought the guy gave me a ketoconazole shampoo. So I was just supposed to leave, just apply it and leave it, leave it sit as long as it w- I could. And then it would hopefully make it go away. But like the guy said, he was like, it's going to come back every year. Or you could, or I looked on the internet and they said, you could use Selsun Blue. Like you would cake on the Selsun Blue after your shower or whatever. And you just walk around your house with like crusty shampoo on you for <laughs> half hour or whatever. And I was like, I'm not going to do this. I was, I don't want to say I was lazy, but I was too lazy to do that. So I just thought, well, if it's going to keep coming back, why do I do this? And then I thought, well, what am I really doing by this? Why is the selsin, the selenium killing it? What's happening? Light bulb moment. I went, maybe I'm just deficient in selenium. So I, I don't have selenium in the top layer of skin and that's where it's showing up. So what if I put selenium in to refill all of my cells and then the cells that come up to the top have enough selenium? And the tinea versicolor can't live there, right? It's not suitable anymore. So I did that. And I took, I don't want to go over the doses because it's not typical doses and I don't want anyone to go out and hurt themselves, but I I took as high a dose as they say you could take in the normal literature for a month. So I always had a, I always had a time limit on it. I, even back then I said, okay, this is how long I'm going to take. This was a month. And then I dropped down a dose for two months, I think. And then I dropped down to the very standard 200 microgram dose. Lo and behold, within a couple months, I don't know if you know about tinea versicolor, but it, in the areas of your skin where you have a tan and you get it, it doesn't tan, it looks pale. And in the areas of your skin, like under my arms where you don't really tan, right? It looks reddish or pinkish. So it's very weird. You have this weird like leopardy pattern that's the opposite of your tan. They say you have to go out in the sun to get a tan to tell if it's gone away. I could tell that the red spots on the bottom of my arm were gone. The reddish pinkish spots were gone. And then I went and I looked and I, I, I got out in the sun enough. And then I, the spots went away. I was like, Hey, guess we fixed it. And I've never had it since, but now I do my hair test, which is how I look at selenium levels all the time. And I just take enough selenium to keep myself good. I can tell you, I used to have dandruff. I don't have it anymore. I had that for a long time. I don't think I got rid of that. That was a zinc thing for me. So like the tinea versicolor was selenium. I think the dandruff was a big zinc thing for me, but three of the antifungal minerals that I use, and I'm not treating them with this. I'm just filling people's levels, right? Zinc, selenium, and molybdenum. Funny thing that they're all copper antagonists. They all directly work against copper. Some people would say they lower your copper. Well, I'm not, I test it all. I'm not worried about that. That doesn't scare me. I refill people's levels and then things are good. Interesting thing that all three of the antifungal minerals I use are anti-copper or copper antagonists. Yes. So anyway, but that's that's like the fungal stuff, the dandruff, the jock itch, the athlete's foot, the tinea sure. versicolor, 
They're all fungal connected. I still dose people based on their hair test, based on their blood test. And we talk about doses, whether they feel good or not. And then if we're trying to focus on something, like if I was giving them a dose that I thought was good for them and they come back to me later and they're like, well, it's not quite gone yet. It's not going away. We might try more, but I would say, try this for a week. Try this for a month. See if you see any improvement. If you do, then we might stay with that longer. If you don't, then don't keep taking high doses of things unless it's helping. We try to be prudent and cautious, but yet we're okay with being, because we're testing and people are coming and talking to me, we can be a little bit aggressive as long as they're staying in touch with me and we can say that was too much or that was not enough or you're doing great or that didn't work. And I'll, I'll tell them if something doesn't feel right, back off. For those of you out there who have practitioners who tell you if you're taking something, they're like, this should help. And you start taking and you go, I feel like hot garbage when I take this. And they tell you, oh, that's normal. You're just detoxing. Just take more. When that bites you in the butt, that's not the approach to use. If a kid put their hand on the stove and they burnt themselves, would you then tell them to hold their hand on there twice as long and they won't burn themselves? That doesn't make any sense. That's not how physiology works. So maybe they give you something that's toxic and you shouldn't take it. Maybe if I give people something they don't feel good, maybe they're dumping too much toxicity at once. Okay. So should I make them dump even more by taking more of it? No, <laughs> they can't handle it already. So anyway, but that's just some of the philosophical things I do when I, in these approaches. And I talk about these things in the love your liver program for people who don't, who aren't able to work with me or who don't choose to work with me. I talk about doing these approaches on your own so people can learn what's good for them. Mm, yeah. That's really all we're after in the end is people fixing the problems, but also learning how to keep them away. And if they come back, what was it that probably got them gone in the first place? What have, what has changed that allowed them to come back? So anyway. Great. Great. And then how, if, how about if you just address wrinkles and looking old? Oh, that's a tough one. That is a tough one. We have people, <laughs> when people comment on me, like even a year ago, I was looking at a video of myself from a year ago and I'm like, wow, I look so much better than I did even a year ago. I think I got over a hump. I know actually in the last year, I got over a hump in my vitamin A levels. My vitamin A levels went from a 50, which is like high normal into a 30s, which is still not where I want it. It's very much in the normal, but it's more getting towards the lower level. I wish I knew about wrinkles and skin aging, but it's really just, I have people come and tell me that clients tell me that everybody's saying I look younger. Everybody's saying I look, my skin is glowing. Do I know what does that? No. The thing I always tell people about saggy skin is that sometimes the skin is like a, if you think of the skin like a wetsuit and it's tight. And if you were to, let's say you were to shrink your body inside of the wetsuit, then the wetsuit can get, if the wetsuit doesn't adjust, which wetsuits can't, right? You're going to have a baggier wetsuit. So in terms of if people consistently, especially if they try to starve themselves with diets, they often lose more muscle than fat. You're losing the muscle that holds your skin, holds the shape, right? So we got to keep our muscle mass. That's important. And under eating or under eating, especially protein is a very quick way to that. One of the things I talk about on the diet is when in doubt, eat more protein. That's what our skin is made of. That's what our muscles are made of. That's a big one is just keeping it's like when people lose tons of weight, right? They have saggy skin. So you want to keep your muscle mass, even in your face, like there's face exercises, right? Where you can build muscle and all of a sudden people, I bought some of those jaws or size things. Even it's like a jaw, like a jaw muscle thing and it helps your jawline, but you can exercise your muscles, your face and tighten things up. So there is that, but there's also just collagen. There is quite a bit of research on vitamin A ruining collagen. It's just absolutely terrible for collagen formation. We've got stuff in the mouth showing that it, it messes with like mouth healing. We have people have their dental stuff improve. Like I don't treat dental stuff like wrinkles. I don't treat wrinkles. People just tell me that it's a bonus of the program. So I wish I had a, it, it, the tightening of the collagen, the more nutrients you have in the good ones that we want, the better your skin gets that, you know, it tightens up. We can't fix everything, but we can definitely improve things. So in our limited time left, mm -hmm. let's dive into the Accutane and retinol. Oh gosh. Dangers. Make okay. sure people know. <laughs> we'll cover three things. Accutane, retinol in skin products. There's also retinoic acids in other skin products and then retin-A. 
Okay. So just so you guys know, we have Accutane, which is 13 cis retinoic acid. Retinol is what people call animal vitamin A. And they put it like you see it on those commercials. I forget who it is. Is it Jennifer Aniston or one of the other celebrities? He's like, I love my retinol cream. And I'm just like going to barf watching it. And then there's retin A, which is tretinoin. A lot of women these days in particular are using tretinoin, retin A on their face. You should know, ladies, that there was a huge study on US veterans where they decided that they were going to have these guys and gals be lab rats because they thought that applying Retin-A to their face on a daily basis would help prevent skin cancer. They had to stop the study because too many of them were dying early. Might their skin have looked great? Sure. Yeah, that's possible. You, you may be having great results with your skin while all of a sudden they're developing autoimmune conditions. And they're like, but my skin looks great. And you're like, but you've got lupus now but you've got rheumatoid arthritis. Is that worth the trade? For some people, you know, humans are vain creatures. We are, it's, that's how we judge people, like visual first, right? That's it's just the way we're designed. Nature does it all the time. It's normal. It's normal to have an interest in vanity, okay? But to choose vanity over like actually living longer and the healthier you are, the happier you are. Anyway, don't put, tretinoin on your skin. And then some of you ladies, you may stop it and be like, oh my gosh, my skin went to heck. Well, think of a person who's drinking tons of coffee every day. And then all of a sudden they quit. Like they feel like crap. When you get addicted to drugs, your skin gets addicted to a drug and then you take it away. You have withdrawals, which can look bad and feel bad. I can't solve the problem right away that, that was created by you being misled into taking a poison that there's a whole thing called retinoic acid syndrome where they give retinoic acids to cancer patients and they can die from it. So if you're putting tretinoin, retin-A on your face, that's a problem. I had a woman, I was treating her for laser for bilateral to both leg knee arthritis. And I said, you know what? If you quit your tomatoes habit, tomatoes are super high in vitamin A, but they're also a nightshade, which is associated with arthritis for hundreds of years. I said, if you quit your tomatoes, you won't need the laser anymore and your knees will probably get better. I'm not giving up my tomatoes. You can keep your pain. It doesn't bother me. You can keep it. Go ahead. So let's get into Accutane. Accutane is 13 cis retinoic acid. So uh, when you eat vitamin A, there's three main retinoic acids that it will turn into in your body eventually. There's 13 cis retinoic acid. This is all legitimate. Don't think there's a difference chemically between these things. 13 cis retinoic acid, which is known as Accutane. When it's sold you in a pill, it's called Accutane. Okay, same chemical. This is in the biochemistry textbooks. I'm not making anything up here. If you think that natural 13 cis retinoic acid is somehow different from synthetic 13 cis retinoic acid, you should go talk to some organic chemists because there's no difference. I've got the research like showing that as an example with all trans retinoic acid, when people eat lots of vitamin A vegetables, it raised the all trans retinoic acid in their blood. They could also put on retin-A and raise the all trans retinoic acid levels in your blood. Oh, the important thing to know about this is anything you put on your skin you're absorbing some of it. If it's a lotion, if it's a cream or whatever, it's going into your system. They've shown this with sunscreens. 24 hours later, they can show that the sunscreen compounds are in your blood. Do you think that if you're applying fat-soluble vitamins to your skin, they're going to be in your blood later? This is why I use topical magnesium. It works amazingly at raising magnesium levels. There was stuff a while back, they were talking about pharmaceuticals, like the next wave of pharmaceuticals is going to be topical pharmaceuticals because they're absorbed so well. So basically anything you put on your skin, you have to assume you are absorbing it. One easy way to think about this is if you wouldn't eat it, don't put it on your skin. People will go, oh, that's too far. And I'm like, it's not really. So anyway, Accutane, 13 cis retinoic acid, go on Facebook and search Accutane survivors or Accutane victims. Accutane recovery, you'll find 20,000, 70,000, maybe bigger groups of people who are there trying to fix the damage that ac taking Accutane did to them. If you're a parent and your child is on Accutane or you're, they're thinking about taking it for their acne, you need to know that in the drug databases of side effects, 
the drug with the most sexual side effects in the age group 12 to 17 is Accutane, 13 cis retinoic acid, also called Roaccutane if you're in Europe. This stuff absolutely destroys the reproductive system. Mm -hmm. You've got 12 to 17 year olds who say they basically have a condition where they're like, I can't feel my genitals. Mm -hmm. It's like, I'm smiling. It's just, it's so unbelievable that if you're a parent and your dermatologist says it's fine, there won't be any problems. It's totally okay. They are lying to you. And what they've done when patients have come to them in the past and said, this ruined my life. They're just like, no, it couldn't have been the drug. They took, they can't sell Accutane in the U.S. anymore. It's been recalled. They can sell it as 13 cis retinoic acid or the generic. Mm -hmm. But they can't sell Accutane because it was recalled in the U.S. And yet parents are still giving it to their children, even though there's a black box warning on it, the strongest warning on a pharmaceutical of birth defects. And I believe there might be one for potential suicide. Mm -hmm. Wow. So would you give your child a drug that could cause them to take their life over acne when I'm sitting here telling you it's probably vitamin A toxicity and copper toxicity and zinc deficiency? And if your kid and you wouldn't do a diet to fix it and you'd rather take a drug that could potentially ruin your life. And when I'm talking about Accutane side effects, now I help Accutane victims to recover their health. It is a form of vitamin A toxicity. It is liver injury. It is cholestasis. Anthony Mawson has gone over this in multiple papers. We can fix it. It takes a long time. Accutane damage, retinoic acid damage takes the longest to fix of all of them. I'm not going to dance around it. Drugs are the most potent poisons out there. Mm -hmm. That's why they're stronger than supplements because they make your body do more stuff because they're poisons. So anyway, Accutane, absolutely you are risking the rest of your life in terms of your health to take that stuff. Then we have retinol. Well, retinol and skin products, it may, it may work a little bit. Like I said, you may look better, but that retinol is turning into retinoic acids. That's what it does in your system. So you're basically taking a retinoic acid. It's just doing its skin stuff and then getting reabsorbed. And then if you look at side effects, like I've talked to plenty of people who are like, I use a retinol cream and it made my face worse. Or they say, I have to be really, really careful because if I take too much of it, it makes things worse. Does this not register as like, maybe it's not good for you? Yeah. Putting vitamin A on your face, you may get short-term benefits. You may get external benefits for a while, as long as you take it. But the internal damage is potentially going to stay until you find somebody like me who's telling you to get off of it. And then you have to get off of it in your diet. Then you have to get off of it in your supplements. You have to get off of it in your skin products. You have to get off of it everywhere. So it'd be better to not do it in the first place than to have to come to me to fix it later. If you have health problems already, you, you're probably already vitamin A toxic. So yeah. anyway, okay. there's that. I am really glad you were so strong about that. <laughs> That's the best possible warning. And I also am glad that you said it's longer than the other things, especially the Accutane recovery, but it is possible to come back from that. Yes. So that's great. Okay. So we, one more question about okay. the sun. Is there a safe way to spend time in the sun? Yes. Awesome. Get the poisons out. So here's something that we have people notice all the time on the program. There's different skin tones. So different skin tones have to do different things. So when I say something like, if I were to say the more toxic somebody is, especially if they're pale skinned like me, the more toxic you are, usually you have a much stronger negative reaction to the sun, like easily getting burned yeah. or you have super sensitive eyes to the sun. Like you always have to wear sunglasses. The paler your skin is and the more sensitive you are to the sun, the more toxins you have up in your skin and in your eyes. Now that I've been doing this long enough, like I used to burn really easily. Like I used to know that I could be out in the Tucson sun, Arizona sun for like a half hour with nothing on my skin in the middle of the day. Or, and if I did longer than that, I was going to burn. I'd peel a week later 
Funny thing, do you know that one of the symptoms of vitamin A, of vitamin, acute vitamin A poisoning, so if somebody, let's say they drank their bottle of vitamin A supplement or whatever, the symptoms of vit- acute vitamin A poisoning are skin reddening and peeling, <laughs> desquamation. What are the symptoms of a sunburn, skin reddening, and peeling? What do you think the sun is basically baking in your skin? Vitamin A. So what we see is as people, here's the weird, this is the thing about the tan that I wanted to say is as people get the vitamin A out of their system, they start telling me, I've had this happen myself and other people tell me that all of a sudden their eyes aren't so sensitive. They don't have to wear sunglasses outside all the time. And now they don't burn anymore. But the weird thing is oftentimes they're telling me, I don't really tan that much either though which is weird. But what I was telling, so then here's a funny thing I've seen around Twitter. There's like the guy, a guy called the tan man or something. They'll say, if you want to get a really good tan, you got to eat lots of vitamin A. (laughs) And I'm sitting here saying, when I get people detoxed from this stuff, they don't really tan, but they don't burn either. (laughs) So we have people can go out in the sun longer and not burn. But if you're white like me, you're not going to get a tan. But if you want to get like all sorts of problems, you could eat more vitamin A and get more tan, which may simply be you charbroiling yourself. And when you stop getting the sun, your body fixes the charbroiling you did to yourself out in the sun. Think of how people, when they're really tan, they look like a cooked chicken, (laughs) right? That's what they look like. Why do we think that you being out in the heat and the light is different than you being in an oven, which has heat and light? It's totally different theory, but so we, and people also, they just don't get the damage from the sun. They there's no burn, right? So if they say, don't go out in the sun so much that you burn, well, the burning is the problem. So what happens if you stop burning in the sun? Is the sun now a problem? I still think If you're pale like me, I'm 97.5% European, like Northern European. I'm like all Viking and Scandinavian blood. So when you look at the people who were in Arizona before the white people got here, their skin is very dark. Not African-American dark, but they're, they're Native American dark. That's not my skin. If I'm not designed for this sun... Maybe too much of it isn't a great idea for me. I'm just not designed for it. So I'm not designed for swimming either, but I can swim. I can swim, but I'm not, I don't have fins. So I can do it, but that doesn't mean I am like blessed. I'm not supposed to live there, Even, especially with my haircut, right? I would have more hair up there if I didn't cut it short. So if I cut my hair short and I'm in Arizona and not Norway, I might need to cover my head more because too much of that sun on my skin. I'm not designed for it. We'll get into the skin aging and the wrinkles. Everybody knows the leather skin people. We all know some of the leather skins where they tan and they tan and they tan and they look old. What causes fats to oxidize? What causes bad oxidation? Heat, air, and light. What is tanning? Heat, air, and light. You're cooking yourself. So it's probably not a good idea to chase a tan. Now, I'm not going to say that going getting spray tan is any better. That's orange. Probably spraying orange things on your skin and absorbing them into your bloodstream isn't that a good idea either. But yes, we regularly have people who say they couldn't go in the sun or like I had one little girl, one little girl, I think she was 11. She was a teenager. Sorry, she was a teenager. She had just gotten, when her cycle came on, that was when her health problems all started, which points towards copper toxicity. But anyway, that's a whole nother story. I was telling her parents that I thought she should get some sun because the girl didn't go outside much. She was having such mental difficulties that she would lock herself in her room in the dark, in the dark, and not talk to anybody for like 30 hours straight. She was having big issues. And at one point, we had to do things like dose her very small, very, very small on everything. They got a vitamin D lamp to try with her because I was saying she should get some light. They tried it, I think, for like either 10 seconds or 30 seconds. She had a gigantic meltdown. Super toxic. 
now she can go out in the sun with her friends because she did they did it long enough that she's less toxic so just think that the degree of your response to the sun is one potential indicator of how toxic you are people who have darker skin you're not going to have this reaction as much because it's your skin is like more of in a protective mm -hmm. state to block the sun but especially pale people yeah people are able to go out in the sun and not have it cause problems it's pretty cool and the eyes thing it's nice not having to wear sunglasses all the time when you go outside you know you can choose oh actually on that note on that note wait everybody's worried about blue light right blue light is the sun so sun is blue light so when you think of blue light as being bad don't ever forget the sun is blue light that's the difference between the sun and firelight firelight doesn't have blue light <laughs> or yellow light or orange light or amber light red light the light of fire right yellows oranges red okay i have a paper on this on my forum blue light can damage the eyes right that's why they say you're not supposed to be on this, this computer screen too long that's why i'm sitting here talking to you on my computer screen with a blue light plastic screen on it so i'm not getting constant blue light from my computer in my eyes funny thing is that blue light they, there was a research done blue light could not damage the eyes if there was not vitamin a present oh wow blue light could not damage the eyes if there was not vitamin a present we have all these people now wearing blue light blockers during the day mm. because they have to protect their eyes from the blue light gosh what might they be toxic with they have to wear sunglasses outside this girl who was super toxic would lock herself in a dark room what do people do when they have migraines? Then other people will say, but you need vitamin A for your eyes to function. And I'm like, we need sunlight, right? We are designed to have sunlight. And sunlight only can damage our eyes with blue light that's in it if there's vitamin A present in our eyes. Are you going to tell me that? I mean, first of all, we have people who have been avoiding vitamin A for four years, like myself. Grant's been avoiding it for, I think, eight years now. I'm going to go shoot in a gun competition tomorrow. So does it seem like my eyes are suffering? <laughs> Probably not. And I go to nighttime gun classes too. And they'll say that you need vitamin A for night vision. What if I were to tell you that I have research showing that the more carrots women ate in a study, the worse their night vision. That kind of shoots that whole thing in the foot, doesn't it? Yeah. So anyway, there's all these things that they all connect. It's really cool. And people like yourself and others tell me they really appreciate it when I start making everything make sense. It might, they may have thought that vitamin A was a vitamin. It's not. And when I tell them what the studies show vitamin A does, the ones that people don't talk about, then they start going, oh my gosh, my eyes are terrible. Yeah. And I used to eat tons of sweet potatoes and carrots and I was eating liver or I was eating egg yolks or I was eating, I was taking vitamin A. I used to give people vitamin A supplements. I feel terrible about it. Years ago, I was giving it to them. And now I know better and I'm doing better by being out here and helping people to not get stuck in that. So anyway, but yeah, there's a lot of stuff out there. When we start figuring it out, just less vitamin A in your diet, even if it was just less, is better for you than more. Yeah. There you go. Thank you, Dr. Smith. Let's wrap up with you sharing how people can work with you. Okay. If you want to work with me doing what I call testing and consultation, that you go to nutritiondetective.com. There's the packages. There's a link called consultation. You can go there. If you want more information on how we work first, you can go and read the website, of course, but you can also email Julie, who's awesome, mm -hmm. at um, admin at nutritiondetective.com. She's super helpful at answering questions and talking to you about logistics of getting the testing done. We have worked with people in 28 different countries. Wow. So if you're in a different state of the US and you're like, I can't work with you, Dr. Smith, because I'm in. California. No, that's not a problem. We worked with people in 28 countries. Somebody told me the other day on Instagram, they're like, I'm in Arizona. I'm like, in a, in a joking way, I was like, I don't care. Like, you don't need to be, I don't have an office where I see people. I do it all virtual. Everything I do is virtual. The Love Your Liver program is my do it yourself program for people to help themselves. So when people get the testing and consultation packages with me and they get the six months of support, they automatically get into the Love Your Liver program. 
So that's like all the information that I want them to know that I can't teach them in a console. If people can't work with me or don't want to work with me, or maybe have just gone, they've worked with me long enough, they don't need me anymore. Some people, I've got people working with me for like eight or nine years now (laughs) because they like it. Anyway, they could do the Love Your Liver program, which is a standalone thing. That's members.nutritiondetective.com. That's the Love Your Liver program website to go there. If you want to follow me, we'll give you all my social media links. There's my YouTube channel where we do a weekly live stream every Friday morning. Times could change eventually, but yeah, Friday mornings, 8 a.m. And uh, that's fun. That's We do subscriber Q&A and I usually cover a couple topics each day. So those are the ways that people could get in touch with me. If you look around Nutrition Detective on the internet, you'll find me. So That's right. And I will be sure to include those links with this video. Now, if you're watching this video on Rumble or Gab TV, make sure to follow the link to where the transcript and notes are, because that will have everything for you to browse. Thank you so much, Dr. Smith. I feel enlightened, encouraged. It's been really good information. I know it's going to bless and help people. So I appreciate your time and your wisdom and your caring. You make a difference. Thank you. You are very welcome. Thanks for having me on. God bless you all. Bye-bye. Bye.